Tonight we're studying about overcoming harsh judgments and fault finding. Uh, as many of you know, I just retired about six months ago, and uh, my wife thought this cartoon was very appropriate. The husband's just been home. He says, well, after just a week at home, I've come up with a comprehensive list of how things how to do things more efficiently around here, honey. And the caption says, the real reason many men don't live long in retirement. Uh, being too critical will certainly get us in trouble. Uh, wrong way. Well, sometimes in the Bible, judging is forbidden. Other times in the Bible, it's, it's encouraged. If you look at Matthew 7, 1 through 2, it says, Do not judge, or you too will be judged. For in the same way you judge others, you will be judged, and with the measure you use, it will be measured to you. Luke 12, 57 says, Why don't you judge for yourselves what is right? And there's a number of other passages we can pull into this as we get through our study. So what's the difference between judging in the Bible when it's condemned and judging when it's encouraged? So that's what we're going to talk about, about a little bit tonight. Um, what judging is for, is not forbidden in the Bible? And he lists, uh, our author lists about six different things here, and we'll take a look at these now. Uh, judgment in civil courts. And if you look at Romans 13, 1 through 7, it says, Let everyone be subject to the governing authorities, for there is no authority except which is which God has established. Consequently, whoever rebels against the authority is rebelling against what God has instituted. And those who do so will be bring judgment on themselves. For the, for the one in authority is God's servant for your good. They are God's servants, agents of wrath to bring punishment on the wrongdoer. Therefore, it is necessary to submit to the authorities not only because of the possible punishment but also as a matter of conscience. Give to everyone what you owe them. If you owe taxes, pay taxes. If revenue, then revenue. If respect, then respect. If honor, then honor. So we see from this that the civil laws, God wants allows judgment there, and it's not wrong. If a Christian, you might say, is uh, on jury duty, is it wrong to sit there in judgment of that defendant? No, it's not. If you happen to be a Christian and a man or a woman ends up being a judge in one of our civil courts, it's not wrong for them to pass judgment because these, these authorities are established by God and we have every right to do just that. Um, then there's in the church itself. And uh, the church, different situations can arise in congregations where judgments have to be made about the members. Uh, disorderly members do have to be held accountable. In 1 Thessalonians 5, 1 through 13, and talking about the church at Corinth there, it says, actually reported that there is sexual immorality among you and of a kind that even pagans do not tolerate. A man is sleeping with his father's wife. Don't you know that a little yeast leavens the whole batch of dough? Get rid of the old yeast so that you may be be a new unleavened batch, as you really are. But now I'm writing to you that you must not associate with anyone who claims to be a brother or sister, but is sexually immoral, a greedy, an idolater, a slanderer, a drunkard, a swindler. Do not even eat with such people. What business it is of mine to judge those outside the church? Are you not to judge those inside? God will judge those outside. Expel the wicked person from among you. So if you look at that reading, you can see there's clearly situations where in the church, uh, this is generally going to be up to the elders, then leading the congregation as a whole involved in this. Fortunately, it doesn't seem to come up very often. But at the same time, we have this situation where judging is clearly approved and necessary. We also have situations where we have to make individual judgments on evil people. And again, let's go to some scriptures here. Matthew 7, 6. 
Do not give dogs what is sacred. Do not throw your pearls to swine. If you do, they may trample them under your feet and turn and tear you to pieces. So in this analogy, Jesus is actually saying there are some people that are so wicked you can look at them as, as dogs or, or pigs or swine. And so, yeah, we have to make a judgment. We have to say something about a person's manner of life. And in this case, he was talking about passing your pearls before swine, spending your time, you might say, with someone that has no respect at all for that. In Titus 3, 11 and 12, it says, warn a divisive person once and then warn them a second time. After that, have nothing to do with him. You may be sure that such people are warped and sinful. They are self-condemned. So again, this is in the body of Christ where you have someone who's being very divisive and trying to put a wedge between members, trying to cause division in the body, and this is how you're to deal with them. There's another situation where we have to recognize the sinful faults in others. And again, this is going to require judgment on our part. It says, my brothers and sisters, if one of you should wander from the truth and someone should bring that person back, remember this, whoever turns a sinner from the error of his way will save him from death and cover a multitude of sins. So we can see that that's a, a situation where we're going to have to recognize what's going on in a person's life, and we'll look at some more examples of stuff like this a little bit later. But a judgment's going to have to be made, and we'll have to come to some decision on deciding when a brother or sister needs to be brought back and brought to repent of something that they've been falling prey to. And then I lump these last two into the same category, and that's decisive preaching on truth and error and also identifying false doctrine, because they sort of fall into the same category. But if we look at Matthew 7, 1 through 5, it says, Watch out for false prophets. They come to you in sheep's clothing, but inwardly they are ferocious wolves. By their fruit you will recognize them. Do people pick grapes from thorn brushes or figs from thistles? Likewise, every good tree bears good fruit, and bad trees bear bad fruit. A good tree cannot bear bad fruit, and a bad tree cannot bear good fruit. Every tree that does not bear good fruit is cut down and thrown into the fire. Thus, by their fruit you shall recognize them. Planned ahead tonight a little bit. <laughs> Second Peter one and two still deals with false prophets, and it says there are also false prophets among the there were also false prophets among the people, just as there will be false prof, false teachers among you. They will secretly introduce destructive heresies, even denying the sovereign Lord who brought bought them bringing swift destruction on themselves. Many will follow their depraved conduct and will bring the way of truth into disrepute. So we can see from these two scriptures, there's clearly situations where you have to make a decision, you have to make a judgment about false doctrine and false teaching. Anybody have a question or comment along that line? Michael said you could make a, a, different, a different way of looking at the word judgment and making a righteous discernment instead of calling it a judgment. And that's true. That's another way of looking at it. Anybody else? Yes. Someone will have to help me. My hearing is terrible. <laughs> Uh, James 4, 11 and 12 says, Brothers and sisters, do not slander one another. Anyone who speaks against a brother or sister or judges them speaks against the law and judges it. When you judge the law, you are not keeping it but sitting in judgment of it. There's only one lawgiver and judge, the one who's able to save and destroy. But you, who are you to judge your neighbor? So there's times where you, you don't make those kind of judgments. Let me get something here. I got a 
head here just a little bit. I skipped one. What kind of judging then does Jesus forbid? And um, it talks here about sharp, unjust criticism or judging on ill will towards someone with no evidence to support it. The kind of judging forbidden by the Lord is harsh, hasty, unfounded, hypercritical, uncharitable, malicious, slanderous, or ill-natured judgment. And, of course, we can recognize all of that as being the most really severe type of treatment you can have towards someone. And the one thing that they didn't address really, I guess, here, but it comes out in some of these other points, and that's us not knowing the thoughts or intents of a person. We can't read their heart like God can. And so there's a time when we make a judgment on someone and not really knowing you know, their thoughts or intents. He deals with this a little bit in two passages. One of them I just read a minute ago, and that is where he's talking about, uh, but you, who are you to judge your neighbor? And so there's a situation where God doesn't want us passing judgment on those. In Matthew 7, 1 through 5, sort of the, the, the classical text that Jesus taught on judging, uh, it says, do not judge or you will be judged, for in the same way you judge others, you will be judged. And with the measure you use, I will, it will be measured to you. Why do you look at the speck of sawdust in your brother's eye and pay no attention to the plank in your own eye? How can you say to your brother, let me take the speck out of your eye, when all the time there's a plank in your own eye? You hypocrite, first take the plank out of your own eye then you'll see clearly to remove the speck from your brother's eye. So all of us are familiar with this uh, in terms of us being so critical of others at the same time we have worse faults and larger faults than the person we're being critical of. And so that's the kind of judging that Jesus doesn't want us doing. Now we've all known someone who's been very critical that it just seems to be their nature. Some of us may have grown up with a with a parent who was hypercritical. You could never do anything right. You may have had a coach or a teacher that you could never do anything right. Uh, I played for a gentleman in high school, and he was a small college All-American basketball player, extremely talented. Well, guess what? None of his players were as good as him. And buddy, he was tough. And uh, I think in Three years I played for him, I never heard but maybe one comment that was in a good favor toward me. <laughs> and so you play with someone who's so negative, it, it doesn't help you. Uh, we, Gloria and I have an acquaintance whose father is just what I alluded to there. His father is a very smart man. He's very talented at building things and remodeling. His son took it upon himself to do some repairs to his own house. And I saw it, I was amazed. He did an excellent job. But his father just blew him away. First thing he did was start telling him what he should have done different. Didn't say one word of comment in a good way about what a good job he did. And needless to say, that young man and his father, to this day, do not have a good relationship. Uh, some of you probably have other situations you may can think of where you too have had somebody that was extremely critical and where you just shuddered when you were around them sometimes. Uh, I know Michael's sitting here. Preachers get a lot of complaints, I'm sure. Lonnie is an elder here. He's probably had a member or two that was a little hard to please. My father was an elder for over 30 years, and I, I remember there was one particular member they had that uh, regularly had complaints lists of what needs to be done differently as a congregation. And so, even that's the reason our lesson is tonight, even as Christians, we can be guilty of what we're talking about. Questions or comments, anybody? All right, what causes somebody to be so judgmental and judging and moat hunting or spec hunting as we talk about? And our author brings up three, four things here for us to think about says an effort to divert attention from one's own sins, an effort to justify, justify one's own sinful life and console a biting conscience, an intent to build up oneself while tearing down another, and 
the last one is just plain old envy and hatred. Uh, let's look at each of those a little bit. An effort to divert attention from one's own sin. The perfect example of this was Judas. And if you remember the story, Mary had some costly perfume. And she poured it on Jesus' feet and washed it with her hair, as I recall. But who criticized her? Judas did. If you look at the John 12, 5 through 6, but one of his disciples, Judas Iscariot, who was later to betray him, objected. Why wasn't this perfume sold and the money given to the poor? It was worth a year's wages. He did not say this because he cared about the poor, but because he was a thief. As keeper of the money bag, he used to help himself with what was put into it. So here's a perfect example of someone being so critical of a good deed that somebody did, and yet their heart wasn't right. And he had his faults that were worse. The next one on the list was an effort to justify one's own sinful life and console a biting conscience. The moat hunter will magnify a minor fault in another and think that, well, maybe I'm not so bad after. 2 Corinthians 10, 12, it says, We do not dare to classify or compare ourselves with some who commend themselves. When they measure themselves by themselves, they compare themselves with themselves, they are not wise. Indeed, we judge in others that of which we ourselves are guilty. Uh, of course, we can all feel pretty good if the standard we decide to judge by is our own self. And we can look pretty good in our own eyes. We're not going to find too many faults that are too hard unless we're being real honest with ourselves. In Romans 2, 1, it says, You therefore have no excuse, you who pass judgment on someone else. For at whatever point you judge another, you are condemning yourself. Because you pass judgment, you who pass judgment do the same thing. And so that's where we have to really be honest with ourselves. We don't fall prey to what he's talking about here. The third reason he mentioned was an intent to build oneself up while tearing down another. And he suggests that some of this may come from the inferiority, inferiority complex. But the Pharisees were really guilty of this type of thing. Uh, in Luke 8, 9 through 14, Jesus addressed this problem with the Pharisees and said to those who were confident of their own righteousness and looked down on everyone else, Jesus told this parable. Two men went up to the temple to pray, one a Pharisee, the other a tax collector. The Pharisee stood by himself and prayed, God, I thank you that I'm not like other people, robbers and evildoers, adulterers, or even this tax collector. I fast twice a week and give a tenth of all I get. But the tax collector stood at a distance. He would not even look up to heaven, but beat his breast and said, God have mercy on me, a sinner. I tell you that this man, rather than the other, went home justified before God. For all who exalt themselves will be humbled, and those who humble themselves will be exalted. So we can see from this example that the Pharisees were guilty of this greater than thou attitude. Uh, of course, we know that Paul was sincere in his efforts. We're talking about the Pharisees as a general, but Paul called himself the Pharisee of the Pharisees. He was so strict in everything he did. But he said in other places he did it with all good conscience. So Paul might be the exception of this greater than thou attitude, possibly. But in this case, we see that the tax collector who was looked down upon people because who did he work for? The government. Romans, and they would often take some of the taxes themselves. So they had a terrible reputation. Um, but in this case, we can see that tearing someone else down is not going to help us. The last reason on the list for being so judgmental is just plain old envy and hatred. He said that envy seeks to rid, get rid of its victim. And a couple examples he gave us from the scriptures. First was Saul. 
if you remember, uh, David did so well, he killed Goliath, and uh, Saul even put him in charge of his military. And then the people started singing a song, right? Remember what that was? That Saul has killed his thousands and David has killed his ten thousands. So it made Saul terribly envious to the point he wanted to kill David. The next Bible examples he gives us is Haman. And this is in a story of Esther. Remember, Mordecai was her cousin who was raising her. Her parents were dead, and Mordecai and Esther were Jews. And Mordecai had gained some favor with uh, uh, the ruler of Persia because he foiled the plot to have him assassinated. And he heard about it, and he told Esther, and Esther told uh, uh, the ruler of Persia at that time, and uh, he knew that Mordecai had done that. Well, then Haman gets promoted, and there was no ruler that you had to bow down to him, but he had a taste of honor among the king's people. But everyone else was honoring Haman, but Mordecai being a Jew, he wasn't going to bow down to him, just like Daniel didn't. And Mordecai and Haman just hated Mordecai. He wanted him, and he ultimately tried to kill all the Jews. And he, if you remember the story, he built some gallows that he was going to hang Mordecai on, and the truth came out. And Esther revealed the plot to the king. And the king then had Haman hanged on the same gallows that he built for Mordecai. But here's where you see envy destroy a person. Just like it destroyed Saul, it destroyed Haman, it'll destroy us today. If we let envy and hatred get the best of us. The harsh judge and the moat hunter is actually worse off than his victim. Uh, he gave an illustration here that I'd never heard before. You may have heard it. He says, when you point your finger, because remember, you got three fingers pointing back at you. <laughs> Plus, your thumb is pointing down, which was the, the condition your heart was in when you did that. And uh, I thought that'd be a good illustration to bring up to little kids when, you, when we're young and very impressionable. They can remember that pointing your finger, you better look out. Um, the harsh judge has a beam in his eye, whereas the victim has a moat. So you can see the, the judge is worse off by far, implying that the beam being a log, a stick of timber, like a ceiling rafter, if Lord joys, a moat just being a speck of sawdust. So Jesus pictures this harsh judge as having this humongous log sticking out of his eye, trying to go over and get this little tiny piece of sawdust out of his neighbor's eye. And he, again, goes back to the Pharisees when we look at what they did. And as you remember, they were forever criticizing Jesus and his disciples about, number one, they didn't follow the tradition of washing your hands before you eat. And Jesus would heal on the Sabbath day. And yet Jesus points out in Matthew 15 and 4 through 6 that the Pharisees were not even taking care of their older parents. Remember, we have a, one of the Ten Commandments honor your parents, honor your father and your mother. And the Pharisees were getting around that by saying, well, whatever I was going to help you with, I already gave to the temple. So they didn't have any left. They'd already given it to God. And so he really made it, uh, them look so bad when he really called their hand on things like this. Um, another reason the harsh judge is worse off is he's actually a hypocrite. Matthew 7, 5, we've already read where he said, you hypocrite, first take the plank out of your own eye, then you can see clearly how to remove the speck from your brother's eye. Uh, the harsh judge is, is just pretending. So he's pretending to abhor sin or whatever is being wrong in the person he's criticizing. At the same time, he's going to approve of the same behavior, if not worse, in himself or in those people that he really likes. Anybody have a question or comment up to this point? Well, why is it so unjust to judge others the way we're talking about? Uh, the author of our lesson gave us five reasons to think about. And the first one is, is, is so true. You never really are likely to know all of the circumstances and facts surrounding the situation. And how many times can you might think about something that you 
were witnessed in your life where you really learned about it, you know, I was wrong about that. They had a reason for why they did that. Uh, way, way back before cell phones, I, mean, I think most everybody in our class knows that except one or two. <laughs> I remember a situation when, and it was, I think it was probably along the same line of this lesson, but uh, a young man had had his car break down late one night. The only store open was a liquor store. So if you didn't have a cell phone, you had to get to a phone. If you didn't have a pay phone, and yes, we had pay phones back then. Well, he had to go in a liquor store, and somebody at church saw him. You know, and so you can see, not understanding the circumstances and really what's going on, you could draw the wrong conclusions by why that young man went to the liquor store. And so there's countless episodes where we don't know everything. The one I always think about is, is divorce situations among Christians. Uh, you want to be honest about it, and I understand Christians and elders want to try to know and get to the bottom of it. But us as individual Christians, we may not be well aware of the situation at all. We may not know what happened. Uh, one of my friends growing up, his sister, unfortunately went through a divorce after about four or five years of marriage. And the, uh, they went to church with us. Her dad was an elder. And the young man insisted he had done nothing wrong. They just couldn't get along. He traveled a lot. Well, her father, knowing that they really needed a scripture reason for them to get divorced, he actually hired a private detective because he had to know the young man wouldn't admit it. But the private detective called him in and out motel rooms while he traveled with all kind of women. And so at least she knew in her mind the divorce paper was going to say irreconcilable differences of why they got a divorce. Because to prove it in a court of law, you actually got to have a picture of the act, basically. So there was no way to do it. But in their heart, they knew what was right. But now someone else, not acquainted with the whole story, might think she had no reason, no scripturally, to get a divorce. So they didn't know all the facts. They didn't know everything, but they tried to, had to get everything together to prove that this young man was really unfaithful to her. Anybody have a question or comment about that? Um, the next is impossible to be impartial in our judgment. Most of us would probably think we can be fair impartial. And yet we may find that we really struggle. Now, I'm not picking on teachers, but I remember clearly reading a, an account a few years ago. They did a little test. They had the teachers grade a paper. The first paper was extremely neat, handwriting was just crisp, clear, everything. The next paper was sloppy, marks all over it, Content was correct. The teachers downgraded the sloppy one. The idea was, as much as you think you're impartial, we're, we're affected by all kind of things. The cartoon, I actually tried to see if I could find it, but I couldn't. And you may have seen it too, but it's a sort of a self-righteous person sitting on a pew, and his nose all up in the air, and he's looking down the pew at this big, muscular, tattooed biker with his head bowed, looking really humble. And the pious one say, I'm glad I'm not like him. The idea was, you can't go just by what we see on the outside sometimes. We don't know the heart. And this is what he's pointing out here, that we don't know uh, all the things, and we can't be impartial when we're influenced by a lot of things. Anybody have a question or comment about that? Not everything we condemn in others is actually a sin. And that, that may make you stop and think a minute. Uh, Jesus was accused of blasphemy because he claimed to be the Son of God. But he, he wasn't guilty of blasphemy because he was the Son of God. Uh, we can be really harsh on our brothers and sisters. Do we have a dress code in the Bible about exactly what we're supposed to wear to church? 
Interactive. Okay. But uh, we don't have a real dress code particularly. I remember uh, a number of years ago, we had a, a brother that really thought you should never put a person on the Lord's table when we passed the trays if you didn't have a coat towel. I mean, he was dead serious about that. Now, I believe in us looking presentable and trying to think about it. The word I always heard was putting your best, forward, best foot forward for God. But we can be awfully harsh and critical of what people wear to church to the point that we are wrong. It's not a sin that what they've got on. Now, they want to talk in here and modestly dress. That's a different story, you might say. But we're just talking about somebody that wants to wear a, their favorite T-shirt to church. We can't, we can't say that that's wrong and sinful unless they got something profanity printed on it. <laughs> but everybody gets the point here about sometimes you can be so upset about something and so judgmental in the way people are doing things, but when you stop to think about it, it's not sinful. It's just not the way you would do it. And so that's what he's trying to get us to stop and think about. Questions or comment, anybody? The fourth reason is the right to judge is not ours, but the Lord's. And these are the kind of judgments that, that God has condemned that we're talking about. Uh, 1 Corinthians 4, 3 through 5. I care very little if I am judged by you or by any human court. Indeed, I do not even judge myself. My conscience is clear, but that does not make me innocent. If the Lord who judges me, it is the Lord who judges me. Therefore, judge nothing before the appointed time. Wait until the Lord comes. He will bring to light what is hidden in the darkness and will expose the motives of the heart at that time. That's what we were hinting at a little while ago. You and I can't see the heart. We don't know what somebody's thinking. And so it's not our place, you might say, to judge things when you can't judge everything that's going on in their heart. Um, we can do a little fruit inspection, as we read about a little while ago. But other than judging the heart, we're just not going to be able to do that. Romans 14.4, who are you to judge someone else's servant? For their own master, servants stand or fall. They will make, and they will stand, for the Lord is able to make them stand. Again, telling us, and there are these cases where we shouldn't be judging. James 4, 11 through 12, brothers and sisters, do not slander one another. Anyone who speaks against a brother or sister or judges them speaks against the law and judges it. When you judge the law, you're not keeping it, but sitting in judgment on it. There is only one lawgiver and judge, the one who is able to save and destroy. But you, who are you to judge your neighbor? Again, we're looking at the judging of the heart where we don't really know what's going on in a person. fifth reason he gave is we see only the outward man and not the inward man. And this is really the same thing we're talking about, a little different slant to it. 2 Corinthians 4, 16 through 18. Therefore we, do not lose, therefore, we do not lose heart, though outwardly we are wasting away, yet inwardly we are being renewed day by day. For our light, <coughs> for our light and momentary troubles, are achieving for us an eternal glory that far outweighs them all. So we fix our eyes not on what is seen, but on what is unseen. Since what is seen is temporary, and what is unseen is eternal. <coughs> all right. Um, what a difference it can make in our judgments if, if, of others if we could only see beneath the surface, seeing their motives, intents, inner battles, and desires. Those are the things we can't know. So that's why it's so hard for us to make any judgment that's going to involve the heart of somebody. Well, what's the remedy for judging? What's going to help us with that? We, the song for our, before our class tonight was perfect because it was about love. And as you can imagine, 
We didn't even look at the other ten things he listed here. Love alone should be enough to help us. Uh, 1 Corinthians 13, 4 through 7, love is patient, love is kind, it does not envy, it does not boast, it is not proud, it does not dishonor others, it is not self-seeking, it is not easily angered, it keeps no record of wrongs, love does not delight in evil but rejoices with the truth, it always protects, always trusts, always hopes, and always perseveres. In 1 Peter 4, 8, it says, Love each other deeply because love covers over a multitude of sin. Uh, let's see, I've been a Christian now 59 years. And fortunately, in 59 years, I've seen some difficulties in the church, some division in the church, arguments in the church. I was in a business meeting in a small congregation that didn't have elders, and a member invited the preacher to go out in the parking lot and fight to settle a dispute. I was in college at the time, and I was, let me, let me go back home. <laughs> you know, the, the remedy for all the problems that I've witnessed all those years, the thing I didn't see was what he's talking about here. There was no love for one another. Because if they had been, there wouldn't have been no division in the body. There wouldn't have been nobody inviting somebody in the parking lot to fight. And so you see how that would remedy all these things that we're talking about. Um, number two on the list was consider how despicable it is. Um, of course, the example of Judas that we just read a minute ago in John where he's criticizing Mary. And it, when you read the story, it just makes you despise Judas. You know, his whole attitude and knowing how his heart was. Um, some people just, I guess you could say, maybe it's their nature or whatever, but they sure do have a tendency to be in what we call a picker. They can pick at anything and any problem and just can't let it go. Practice the golden rule. We're going to have to speed things up here. Matthew 7, 12. Do everything uh, to others that you would have them do to you, for this sums up the law and the prophets. Certainly, we don't want somebody nitpicking us and being so judgmental of us. We don't need to do it to them. Uh, Self-examination. Uh, we actually are taught to do that. Everyone ought to examine themselves. Of course, he's talking about eating the Lord's Supper there. But then in 2 Corinthians 13, 5, examine yourself to see whether you're in the faith. Test yourselves. So if we're being honest with ourselves and the faults that we all have, that's going to help us to not be so picky of others. Look for the good in others. Uh, now, none of us, if we'd have known Paul before he was a Christian when he was Saul, how many of us would have voted for him to be an apostle? <laughs> Remember, this is the man that put Christians to death. We wouldn't have given any chance that Paul would ever be faithful to God and be the kind of person he was. God saw his heart, though. So God knew Paul better than, than we would know him just by seeing him. Barnabas is the one in the Bible that's always spoken so well of. When Paul first, when he was still Saul and he comes back to Jerusalem, they wouldn't have anything to do with him because of his reputation. But Barnabas, being the person as he was, the encourager, he went to him and took him. Now you go far as a little further in the book of Acts. Uh, Mark left the first missionary journey, I believe. We don't know the reason. We know he quit in the middle of it. So uh, Paul didn't want to take him on another missionary journey. But Barnabas did. Barnabas took him. And in the future, Paul spoke highly of Mark. He had redeemed himself in Paul's eyes. So we know that there are those that see the good in others that maybe uh, we might be blind to it, and we need to make ourselves take time to notice it. Um, what do you see on that page up there? Most would say, well, it's just a big black dot. But do you realize that 98% of that up there is white, and you've got this small little area that's black? That's like we do with people when we judge them. If they've got some faults and we, we just focus on the one aspect of their life that we disapprove of and that we thought something bad about. 
uh, asking God to help us in overcoming this sin. Of course, we all know that Jesus in Matthew 7 says, Ask and it will be given to you, seek and you will find, knock and the door will be opened unto you. If, if we really find that we have a real problem being too critical of others, we need to work and get God to do it. Consider how much hurt you inflict in the heart of the victim. Yeah, when someone's been harshly criticized, it's demoralizing, it discourages them, even to the point of uh, giving up. Uh, the thing that always comes to my mind, just because it was so prevalent recently, was what went through when they were trying to get Brett Kavanaugh and Amy Tony Barrett approved. The vicious, vicious attacks that were launched against their character. Character assassination. Totally unfounded. And so I hated the way the, the treatment was there. And see, that's what we're talking about, the treatment of others with situations like this. Eighth reason to be considered the victim, if it was your brother or your sister, certainly we're going to be a whole lot easier on, on people that we feel for. Put yourself in the other person's shoes. We've all heard the saying, walk a mile in my shoes. And I came across this rendition of it. See what I see, hear what I hear, feel what I feel then maybe you'll understand why I do what I do. Until then, don't judge me. Remember that our judgments are often wrong. And he gives us two examples in here. Uh, when they were picking the replacement for King Saul, remember what uh, they were told? They brought all the sons of uh, uh, Jesse before them, and they were a lot bigger, a lot older, a lot stronger than David. And that's when they were told in 1 Samuel 6 through 11, that God judges not by the outward appearance, but by the inward appearance. That's why David was picked. He was a man after God's own heart. And then we have the example of David's brother when he shows up to, to the battle with the Philistines, and his brother just chastises him about coming out there and missed the whole reason why he was there. Um, the 11th reason was consider what judging will do to you. This can be very thought-provoking for us. It will blind you to your own faults. It will destroy your friends. It will blind you to the beauty and virtues of others, and it will rob you of your happiness. Let's get on down here a little bit further. We need to be judicious, but without harsh judgments of others. While we have to separate good from evil and sound teaching from false doctrine, we can do so without harsh judgments, unjust and without unjust judgments. Of others. I think Michael's got a few announcements for.